welcome to the Red Sneaker Podcast, your guide to success in the worlds of writing and publishing. Now, here's your host, best-selling author and founder of the Red Sneaker Writers Center, William Bernhardt. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining me. I'm glad you're here. I have a few news items I want to discuss up front, and then we're going to have an interview with Jessica Lowry, a terrific writer whose new book, Mercy's Chase, just hit the stands last week. She has some fascinating things to say, not only about writing, but also about the challenge of writing in multiple genres and why she thinks it's important for every writer today to consider being a hybrid writer. Before we get to that, though, let me talk about the news. We actually have some sales data coming in, mid-year sales information first. The Census Bureau says that in July, bookstore sales rose a little bit, 4.9%. It didn't help the year. Overall, for the year 2018, bookstore sales are still down a little bit, but not catastrophically. Overall, it looks like sales are remaining essentially flat. We also have some even more interesting information from the Association of American Publishers about book sales during the first half of 2018. Now, let me say a few things right up front about the Association of American Publishers. This is a group representing just over a 1,000 publishers. All of the big five New York publishers are there, but guess who isn't? Amazon, of course, is not a member So anytime people are citing statistics from the AAP, they're giving you retail sales data that does not include the nation's largest retailer of, among other things, books. More than 50% of all books sold in the United States are sold at Amazon. And if you're talking about eBooks, it's way more than that. So you got to look at those AAP statistics with a grain of salt. Take them with a grain of salt. Anytime you see one of those articles about how ebook sales are supposedly dropping, that's going to be AAP statistics because at the big five, that may well be true. But at Amazon, it is certainly not. Anyway, with that proviso up front, what does the AAP say is happening in sales? Well, they say total net book sales in the first half of this year fell but only 1.4%, still leaving this as an industry of over $5 billion, which is not bad at all. What was most interesting to me were the various categories and the degree of change in each of those book categories. Most of the categories show a decline in sales, anywhere from 0 to 23%, but there are a handful, six categories to be precise where sales are actually increasing and you want to guess what the top one is what sector of the book market is showing the greatest increase in sales downloaded audiobook while almost everything else is on the decline downloaded audiobook is increasing by 35 percent that's an increase of over 200 million dollars By downloaded audiobooks, I mean people downloading directly to their phones or other mobile devices. And this is huge. Other areas of increase. What's number two? This might surprise you. Religious hardcovers. Not soft covers. Religious hardcovers. Primarily the Christian market. Showing a 12% increase in sales. Now that's only a third of what audiobooks are doing. But still. It's significant. Adult hardcovers and paperbacks showed some increase. University press ebooks and hardcovers have shown some increase. Everything else is in decline. Children's, young adult, higher ed books, university press, children's board books, mass market paperbacks, you name it. Everything else is on the decline. And guess what's at the very bottom of the list? In other words, what category is declining the most? Physical audiobooks. In other words, audiobooks on some kind of physical medium, CDs being the obvious. So while downloaded digital audiobooks are at the very top of the list showing the most increase, audiobooks on physical media like CDs are at the very bottom. 
that sector is on its way out. Downloaded audiobooks are huge, so I can only say to you, Red Sneaker writers, which you have heard me say before, there is no excuse for not having an audiobook of your book, your short story, whatever it is, nonfiction, essays for that matter. You can do it yourself, assuming you have the rights. To have some intellectual property and not have an audiobook, that's just leaving money on the table, and for no good reason. Last time I talked about Barnes & Noble and their disappointing sales reports, we did have one interesting development in the last couple weeks. An SEC filing reclosed that Richard Schottenfeld, who was the head of an investment firm called Schottenfeld Management Corporation, has increased his stake, that is, his holding in Barnes & Noble. The indications are that he... Well, quoting himself, he called Barnes & Noble a, an attractive acquisition target. He is, it would appear, increasing its stake with an eye toward possibly acquiring the company, may have in fact already made an offer, according to the recently fired Barnes & Noble CEO, but that after they conducted due diligence, which is when they send in lawyers and accountants to look over the books, they decided not to do it. Well, anyway, this raises some fascinating possibilities, which frankly had not even occurred to me before. If Barnes & Noble were to be acquired by somebody who actually knows how to run a retail store chain, that could change everything. So it's just remotely possible that Barnes & Noble may not be disappearing quite as quickly as I thought it was going to be doing. Two more stories. First, we got a report from the Wall Street Journal that Amazon is investigating its own employees because there are indications that they are being bribed. That is, they are being paid to leak confidential internal data that would be of use to merchants selling products like, you know, books. I've written in the past about a program called KDP Rocket, which is great for coming up with the key search terms, key terms that you want to use in order to make your Amazon marketing services or Amazon ads do better. You know, you got to have the right key terms to target where you want your advertising to go. Well, KDP Rocket is a great program, but imagine if you had insider information from an Amazon employee telling you what you ought to do. That would be even better, I think. To make this story even more interesting and easier for a red sneaker writer to relate to, listen to this. There were also indications that Amazon employees were being paid to delete negative reviews from book pages. Okay, hands in the air. How many of you have a review you'd like to see deleted from your book page? My hand is way up in the air. I think my favorite is for uh, a children's book. I wrote a, a biography of Ada Lois Sipuel that was called Equal Justice. And the review, which I think I can quote from memory, says, I didn't mean to buy this book. I downloaded it by accident, so I didn't read it. One star. Forget about bribing employees. This could be a whole new uh, field of endeavor, a whole new income stream for Amazon. Jeff Bezos, are you listening to me? Don't, don't make people rely on bribing employees. Just make this a service Amazon offers. For five bucks, Amazon will delete the review of your choice. I think Amazon income would double. Well, okay, maybe that's an exaggeration, but it's certainly worth looking into, Jeff. Are you listening? There are a lot of us out there who would like to see worthless reviews go away. One last item you may have seen. This comes from the world of crime. It's about a romantic suspense novelist who once penned an essay called How to Murder Your Husband. Why is that in the news? Well, she's been charged with killing her husband. The police in Portland, Oregon, arrested her about a week ago and charged her with the murder. Her husband, who was a 63-year-old chef, was fatally shot in a kitchen at the Oregon Culinary Institute. 
Apparently, somebody watched Star Trek II and heard the line about how revenge is a dish best served cold. As if this weren't incriminating enough, somebody's dug up a 2012 blog in which the author was being interviewed, and she explained what attracted her to romantic suspense stories. She said, quote, Murder, mayhem, and gore seem to come naturally to me which means my husband has learned to sleep with one eye open. End quote. Well, why am I bringing this up in the podcast, Red Sneaker Writers? Here's why. Every year, I do these small group writing retreats, and every time there is someone, often more than one person, who gives me work in which the characters and situations are clearly based on the people the author knows, and the things that have happened to the author. I mean, detectably so. In anybody's work, and especially in their first book, you expect a certain amount of autobiography in the protagonist. Keep it to a minimum, and we can live with that, because after all, you're not going to sue yourself. But when you're writing about other people, it's a whole different situation. Remember, the point of your fiction is not to seek vengeance against your boss or your ex-spouse or your parents or whoever. If there is some useful characteristic in one of these people that you can use, okay, fine, take that one salient detail and invest that in a fictional character who is different from the real-life person in every other respect, looks different, Uh, dresses differently, speaks differently, has a completely different name, not the same name with one letter changed, a completely different name. Trust me, I know people who have been sued over their first book by somebody who thought that they had been libeled, and you don't want to go there. Even if you win, five years of a lawsuit and legal fees are going to spoil the publication experience for you. You do not want to go there. And if you're careful and smart about it, there's no reason to do that. So please do be careful and do protect yourself. And by all means, if you're thinking about murdering someone, don't write about it in advance. Or afterward. Unless, of course, the statute of limitations has expired. You can My interview this time is with Jess Lowry, a terrific superstar writer and teacher we had this year at our annual writers conference in Oklahoma City. You may know Jess because of her widely acclaimed Murder by Month mysteries. Interestingly enough, she has subsequently reacquired the rights to the early books in that series and is now handling them herself, publishing them as the Mira James mysteries. She's also writing another series featuring a character called Salem Wiley, an FBI agent who investigates historical mysteries and conspiracies and things of that nature. But that is just the tip of the iceberg. As you're about to find out, she's written all kinds of work in all kinds of different genres and is not at all embarrassed, ashamed, or challenged by writing just as diversely as she reads. She also has some very interesting thoughts about why, in today's world, writers should, at the very least, consider the possibility of becoming a hybrid writer. That is, considering working not only for publishing houses, but also publishing on their own, independently. Here's the interview. Jess, thank you for being with me today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. I want to talk about your vast array of different books and kinds of books. But first, let me ask you this. What is the best piece of advice you would give someone who aspires to write? You know, I've read probably 50 books on writing. I've been teaching writing for 20 years, uh, but my best writing advice comes from the movie Finding Nemo. <laughs> and it is <laughs> just just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. That story's in you. And if you're listening to this, it's going to come out. So just keep swimming. Don't give up. There's going to be a lot of 
Push.